I'm Martha Cantor. I run College Promise in Washington, D.C. We have 328 Promise communities around the country, and I'm thrilled to introduce my uh, presenters this evening, Millie Garcia. Millie is president of the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. Marnie Baker Stein is provost and chief academic officer of the Western Governors University. Joan Gable is with us. She's president of the University of Minnesota. And Soraya Coley, president of California Polytechnic State University at Pomona. So we're thrilled to have really dynamic speakers. Uh, and our topic is uh, the power of women. So I'm going to kick off with the first question. Uh, and then we'll have a question and answer session for the next 30 minutes. And then we'll close out. So let me ask first. Through your gender and racial equity lenses, as you look ahead, how do you ensure that our nation's students will successfully navigate the challenges to, through, and beyond college and careers? And let's start with Millie. Thank you, Martha. Let me begin by saying that I am honored to serve as president of American Association of State Colleges and Universities, working alongside 400 diverse presidents who are anchored in student success for all students. They are educating the new majority of America, the first generation, the low income, the students of color and adults seeking to receive a bachelor's degree and, and beyond. And so we work together with these presidents and teams to understand the changing demographics that are happening across the country and what are those demographics in their region and how do they serve that new population? They need to know their students, their region, and their communities in their language and their space. And we help them to make sure that they understand and show families that these colleges and universities are welcoming environments where students will succeed. Through Ask You, we provide resources demonstrating promising practices and really good evidence programs that demonstrate students' success and also demonstrate how to eliminate opportunity grant opportunity uh, opportunity yeah. opportunity gaps. Sorry, opportunity gaps. And finally, we work with professional development programs. We prepare leaders of tomorrow, diverse students, and who are thinking to be leaders as well as professionals through our Millennial Leadership Institute, where diverse people look to become presidents of our university from all backgrounds. We have over 165 people who have become presidents, some in their second and third, and they are the most diverse population you can ever imagine. They will leave our campuses to ensure that all students reach their potential. So Joan, what do you think about this question? How are students gonna successfully navigate through women's leadership in their college and career opportunities? Well, thank you, Martha. And it's an honor to be with my um, fellow panelists who are um, amazing women and have come into higher ed and serve these students, all of our students from a variety of points of view. Uh, it's always hard for us as women leaders to answer the question on how women do it because we've never not been women. And so it's always hard to do that side by side comparison. And I see my colleagues smiling as I say this because we get that question a lot. But to the extent that we see more and more women leading in the higher education environment, um, I think we also see um, directly or indirectly, a real thought and strategy around meeting students where they are in the way that you'll, you've already heard described, that we really think about who we're serving, why we're serving them, what sort of support do each of our students need. I think this last year and the challenges of the pandemic have really shown us that people experience the various challenges of an education in very different ways, depending on their life experience and background. And it is incumbent on us to understand that and serve from that point forward. But for large research universities like the University of Minnesota, this also includes real partnership with industry and real pipeline mentorship into graduate school. So for both undergraduate opportunities 
and the professional development that you've already heard about. And we work very closely with the industries here in town. And then we also want to make sure that all of our students, all of our students understand what the graduate school opportunity pipeline is. Thanks so much, Soraya. What do you think? Yes, well, first of all, let me just say that um, I think when you look at uh, women in general, um, we raise our voices. And as a nation, uh, we need to come to terms with the reality of opportunity in this country. And persistent and systemic racism continues to be the enemy of opportunity. And so when opportunities are provided, performance follows. And higher education, I think, is a microcosm of that reality. And so if we're to help our students succeed long after they leave our campuses, then our efforts need to begin long before they arrive on our campuses. And so, for example, in California, we see major disparities across racial and ethnic categories in terms of who's taking the minimum course requirements for even acceptance into our public university. So what does this mean? It says that we need to have greater formal partnerships with K-12 and community colleges, community organizations, foundations, corporations, and other groups aimed at eliminating these disparities. And once our students receive, once they arrive at Cal Poly Pomona, we provide a quality academic and co-curricular experience that's informed by data and requires that they master the knowledge and theory, but also application during their time with us. Because we as a polytechnic university, we think that this is a factor in preparing them for post Cal Poly Pomona careers. We're also focused on creating the kind of climate and addressing systemic barriers that exist on the campus. And we also seek feedback from our alumni, from our employers, from state leaders on the success that we are achieving. Thanks so much. Marnie, with your racial and gender equity lenses, how are we gonna prepare students for the future? Well, research suggests that as few as 16% of college students today actually fit the so-called traditional mold, which is like your 18 to 24 year old undergraduate. Um, most of these students aren't financially dependent on their parents. They're, they're not in college full time. They're not living on campus. Our mandate in higher education from, from my point of view is to drive the personal transformation and economic mobility of today's population. You know, in doing that, we're organized to serve the wrong target in higher education. We're not focused on the population of learners who are right in front of us. You know, who, who is that population? Nearly 40% of them are older than 25 years old. And many of these are caretakers for their children and their extended families. 64% are working while they're pursuing their education and they need a flexible part-time model that works. 31% of them are at or below the poverty line and nearly 60% of today's learners will traverse multiple institutions on the way to their first degree. And what is the demographic of this new traditional learner? They're low income learners, they're disproportionately black and Latino, over half of them are women and first generation college goers. These students are smart and resilient and ready. They see education as a value-based transaction versus an emotional coming of age decision that many traditional college students make. Their aim is not so much about creating an alma mater, but treating education as an investment to improve their career outlook at present and into the future. We need to see them. We need to see these students. We need to build flexible, accessible, and powerful learning models that propel them forward into the opportunities that align with their strengths and their ambitions. Current full-time on-ground traditional learning models are not structured as an experience that's designed to assure these learners succeed. We need to fix that because they're not only new, they're our primary charter. We also need to pay attention to the in-between. Learning now and into the future is lifelong, it's open loop. The higher education system needs to be a system 
that stays with students across a lifetime of learning and across institutions. New services and applications need to be imagined that guide next steps through and between attainment of credentials and work experience to help connect the amazing talent that's out there everywhere with opportunity. Uh, I'll just go to the next question and ask, and I do have a crystal ball in front of me. So as a women leader, and I'm gonna start off with Joan, how, how do higher education, how should higher education leaders prepare students today for jobs that don't exist, especially in COVID and post COVID? You know, what do we do? Uh, everyone's saying these jobs won't exist. What do you think, Joan? Well, I would like to borrow your crystal ball. I think that would be a great way to start. But short of that, I think that uh, there are a couple things that we have to keep in mind. We have always been preparing students for careers that don't exist yet. It has been our students who have brought those new pathways to life. It is the uh, job of an educated person to think broadly, to critically analyze, to think outside the box. This is why we need to develop the kinds of pipelines and partnerships that you've just heard described so that students are prepared to do this. So when we think about being an educated person, we mean that they have an understanding of a various portfolio of arts, science, and skills. But we also mean that they are prepared to be innovative so that they can be able, so that they can pivot and lead into that space. And what I think you'll find is with everything that this generation has gone through, this group of college students was born in the shadow of 9-11. They graduated from high school during a pandemic and they saw the bubble burst in between. And so these, these young people are resilient and already have had to think outside the box and we're seeing them deliver anyway. So I have a lot of optimism about how they'll look through that crystal ball. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's the assets of these students and I'd love to hear Soraya, what you think about preparing students for jobs that don't exist. Well, I think what we need to first um, think about is that uh, disruption is the new normal. And in the United States, the urbanization has accelerated since the Great Recession with a host of societal ramifications. For example, just 25 cities have accounted for more than two thirds of the job growth over the last decade. And it is projected that students who graduate today will have on order 17 job changes across five sectors. And so given that, I think it's just mentioned, rather than focusing on a specific job, we're stressing as a polytechnic institution, the acquisition of knowledge, understanding theory, applying those experiences, and we emphasize creativity, discovery, and innovation. And so we value skills that are transferable across careers, and we want to deepen our emphasis on instruction that has historically been referred to as quote unquote uh, soft skills like perseverance, teamwork, lifelong learning, empathy, appreciation of diversity and leadership. But I call them essential skills. And in fact, uh, recent economists uh, at MIT and Harvard calculated the sum of certain tasks that is found in the US economy over a span of decades and tasks related to social skills, working with new knowledge and solving unstructured problems far outpaced analytical and cognitive tasks. And so I think that universities need to broaden their um, approach. And I think they need to understand and emphasize that balance of the analytical with also what we call the essential skills. Thanks so much. Um, Millie, here's the crystal ball. I'm tossing it to you. Thanks for the crystal ball. And I'm going to agree wholeheartedly with Joan and Soraya. I'm going to add that in addition to the critical thinking and the innovation, you know, as women, we are so able to adapt to change quickly. And we also see that our students are adapting to change quickly. They're doing that exactly, as Joan said, right now 
where our students had to change so quickly to online, to different ways of le learning. And so we have to continue to help students have these experiences to adapt to change. We have to also find ways to put them in those experiences where they could be innovative, where they could be creative, when they could really deal with adapting to change in a learning environment so they can make those mistakes and then move on into the world and go into their careers prepared to change to that disruption that's gonna continue into the future. Thanks so much. Marty, I'm gonna to toss the crystal ball to you. What do we do to prepare students for these jobs that don't exist? Well, the, the future of work is here and now and experiencing such incredible velocity and the shifts in knowledge and skills and mindsets that re are required for an employee to be successful and to thrive. You know, it's demanding a much more agile supplier of talent and readiness in its educational partners. In a recent study, in fact, that was run by Northeastern University, 64% of executives felt that the need for continuous lifelong learning will demand more diverse credential attainment from job seekers and higher levels of education across the board in the future. And in that same study, most HR leaders reported either having formal or informal efforts at play to reduce the emphasis on traditional degrees and increase the prioritization of skills in hiring. This development, you know, it signifies a quantum shift in employer and hiring sentiment that is historically preferred long-term undergraduate or master's degree qualifications for similar roles. So how do we respond? How does higher ed respond? We're not necessarily built for agility and some would argue we shouldn't be. I, I disagree. Now and into the future, people will need to upskill rapidly and continually in response to new and emerging skill sets. It's our job to serve this journey. In this environment at WGU, WGU, we believe that micro credentials are strongly poised to change the status quo of the degree as coin in the realm in the coming years. And we're urgently moving to unbundle our degrees into high value stackable components that can impact a much broader learner audience. Will we still, still offer degrees at WGU? Absolutely, but we're providing students across the life cycle with a broader set of options for how they attain that degree and build on that degree. And we're tagging all of our credentials and competencies to real-time labor market insights so that with every step a student takes in their educational path, we're surfacing real-time insights to our learners and their mentors that can help them to consider career paths and academic options that may have otherwise gone unnoticed and unexplored. Well, I guess we're winding down. So we have the last question for our half hour uh, today. And we're really thrilled to be able to ask this question. So imagine we're all sitting in our offices, out on the field, looking at talking with faculty, working with students, and it's after the election, thank God, and it's after COVID, after we've all been vaccinated. So Soraya, can you tell us, what do you think the most important policy initiatives could be enacted with the federal government going forward when we're post COVID and post election? Well, let me just say, I appreciate that, um, that question um, and I, I want to first start with, with a, um, a premise that I think we need policies where the underlying assumption is that an investment in lower and middle income groups, which emphasizes education, employment, and health care, will generate benefits and fuel the socioeconomy for all. I think we need to shift our mindset that currently exists in a win-lose proposition to a win-win proposition with a rising tide lifting all boats value system. And we need policies that are focused on addressing the racial, ethnic, and gender inequities. This old trickle-down theory has clearly demonstrated that those in the lower and middle strata do not receive the promised benefits. And in fact, we continue to see now a decline in the middle class. And I'm very proud of the social mobility that we at Cal Poly Pomona uh, provide for our students who come from low and middle incomes. 
And so I think that certainly the issue of sufficient resources for higher education, uh, we suffered through the funding cuts of the Great Recession. We're now going to have uh, the impact of the pandemic. And so I think that with sufficient resources, we've already demonstrated how successful we can be in, in graduating students, in retaining students. And so I think that certainly is going to be uh, another, uh, another focus along with basic needs and mental health and understanding the whole student. I think we're also gonna need policies that incentivize and promote the jobs of the future and create pathways that taps into the transformation of current workers and populations disconnected from opportunities. Certainly such areas as climate and environmental issues. We see, for example, the fires in California and what that has resulted in. And finally, I think we need a national focus on the digital divide. I think that has clearly uh, been at the center of our understanding and we try to teach virtually. That's, couldn't agree more. And uh, Millie, Dr. So, Garth, what do you think? So I agree with Soraya, Soraya. And let me begin by saying that ASCU is already has been working on a public policy agenda with our approximately 400 presidents. And the first thing is that we have to support our campuses at federal and state policy. We just had a stimulus package that gave money to institutions and to students. With the disinvestment in state colleges and universities. We need to make sure that there is a push that we continue to support our institutions. As Zaria said, higher education is an asset to the, to the nation, not an expense. And so we have to look at how do we provide dollars, for example, for federal and state partnerships that have matching grants and have other federal policies that promote adequate support for all public institutions, that we work collaboratively and there is incentive to work with our community colleges to ensure there's a seamless pathway so our students will move into these institutions if they so desire without any barriers. Of course, I'm a big proponent of increasing Pell Grants to help the low income, the first gen, the students of color who need those resources. And we have to make sure that we look for ways that student debt for our students is manageable and how do we help them with that student debt? We need to help as well those institutions that are educating the most vulnerable and show success with those students and incentivize them. And Joan, would you like to add to this question? How are we going to prepare students uh, in this post-COVID and post-election at the federal level? What, what should they do? What should the feds do? Well, I have uh, very little to add to what uh, Millie and Soraya just said, a very robust and complete list. But I'll just put a couple of exclamation points on a few things they said, which is, first of all, that if we don't get at the insecurity that many of our students arrive on campus with, then they won't be set up for success to study. So that is, of course, um, fiscal. It's also digital, given the extent to which we're likely to teach online, as was already mentioned. And then there are the basic needs like food and housing and how all of this contributes across the board to over 40% of our students pre-pandemic having some sort of diagnosed mental health issue that we know is affecting their learning and progress and disproportionately affects our underserved students. The one thing I'll add specifically from the University of Minnesota point of view is federal partnerships in two areas. One is in K through 12 to higher ed. We talk a lot about how we need to partner, but it is not incentivized in anything other than the relational sense, which of course we work very hard on, but I think we need to be much more holistic. And the second is on the impact of research universities, along with all the other types of higher ed institutions that you have presented to you today. But speaking from the research university point of view, the economic impact of the thought that goes into the research that we do and the opportunities that that creates for students at all levels, including K through 12, requires investment. And a lot of that investment comes from the federal government and we're very hopeful that that investment will continue if not increase. Marnie, we've got a federal government, a real opportunity going forward to craft some policy recommendations. What are your thoughts about that? I guess 
two really critical directions come to mind. Uh, first, I truly believe, and we believe at WGU, that talent is distributed more equally than access to college degrees. It's time for us to promote alternative pathways to social and economic mobility, to value skills and experiences and dispositions, not just degrees, both in education and in hiring. Skills-based education and hiring can level the playing field and ensure that everyone has access to the opportunities that are available, not just the privileged. The federal government has recently moved to shift federal hiring practices to hire based on skill um, possessed by the candidate rather than degree. I believe that states should move in the same direction as well. And, and perhaps lastly, and, and even more urgently, um, 14 million Americans still lack access to high-speed internet. This is incredible. If we're serious about increasing equitable access to learning, we have to close the digital divide. Federal and state governments should look to support our social safety net with investments in fiber optic, cellular, and satellite networks. It is critical and it's a moral imperative. Well, thanks everyone for a great half hour uh, to really show the power of women in how we think collectively about the challenges ahead. I wanna thank Millie Garcia. I wanna thank Joan Gable. I wanna thank Soraya um, Cooley, Coley, sorry. And I'd like to thank Marnie Baker Stein. All four of you are tremendously talented women leaders. And I just am grateful to ASU GSV for giving us stage X at the summit. See you again next year. Thanks.